Um, yeah, I've got a picture on this slide that I'm probably more comfortable talking about for the last uh, 20 years, including starting really in Cambridge, um, doing research at the Institute of Astronomy um, in Cambridge and in the Cavendish Physics Department on astrophysics, and then went to France and UCL and now Manchester. Um, but uh, some, oh, how do I get to the next slide? Hold on, there we go. Um, and it really, my sort of interest in, in doing academic research really began in Cambridge when I was um, visiting a friend of my dad's um, and uh, he showed us round and took us punting on the river and uh, we went back to his rooms and sort of derived equations about the sun and the, the tides and, and how all that works. And, um, and so I wanted to really go into research after that. And um, about five years ago, I was sort of involved in, a, in a finishing a big project in astrophysics and um, started to think about the next 20 years. And at the same time, my, my kids were starting at school and I was imagining, you know, what am I going to say if they say, what did you do about climate change, mummy? And I say, I looked at the stars and I kind of just, just couldn't really live with that. So um, at about the same time, I was visiting Cambridge um, again um, for a cosmology meeting. And um, I bumped into David Mackay, who some of you will have come across. Um, and so it was actually David Mackay who had taken me and my dad around Cambridge all those years ago when I was at school trying to decide what to do um, and he'd sort of looked out for me and, and been really really supportive over the years so um, and he said he had some health news um, and um, as many of you all know he, he really sadly passed away um, from stomach cancer about four and a half years ago and and I spent a lot of time thinking about the future and, and that was really my sort of epiphany of realizing that I, I had to do something uh, to try to help um, reduce climate change. Um, I'm sure you'll all be aware of this beautiful representation of climate change. If you're not, then, then type in climate stripes into Google and um, basically each, each stripe is a different, the average temperature for a different year. So if you ever meet anybody who's at all skeptical and uh, I always find this, this helps a bit. Uh, but I don't need to convince you guys. So um, uh, on the other hand, a lot of people are sort of puzzled or curious about the relevance of food to climate change. And so I find it useful to just show this pie chart, which illustrates that, that you know, a quarter of all greenhouse gas emissions uh, come from the food system at, at present. Um, and that's increasing, hopefully, um, we, if, we, if we stop burning fossil fuels or drastically reduce fossil fuels, then this green part of the pie will get smaller. But as there are more people eating more, um, more greenhouse gas emitting foods, then the red part gets bigger. So, um, and, and will be the biggest part, um, you know, if, if we stop the, the fossil fuels part. So food is increasingly important. Um, and, and so that's, that was part of what motivated me to get really dig, dig deep into this part of the, 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 the problem. If you're looking for a more detailed version of that, that, that graphic, um, then you can find this amazing uh, diagram uh, from Bojana Bajelc, which was made when she was um, a student in Cambridge in 2013. Um, and you can, you can see food there, the bit that I was referring to there, the 25%, and you can see all the different parts there, and, and more detail than you probably want. Um, but it's fascinating to see the land use change, that the deforestation part of that, for example, and the livestock part. And if you really love this kind of diagram, which I do, as you can see, then you might like this version, uh, which has got rice paddies on there. Uh, that's 2% uh, of all greenhouse gas emissions from rice paddies. Fertilizer use, um, you've got the manure there. Enteric fermentation means cow burps, basically. Um, so that's 5% of all greenhouse gas emissions or 2.5 gigatons of CO2 e per year out of, out of 50. Um, anyway, so there's lots of details if you want to, want to really geek out about it. Um, but for the rest of this talk, I'm mostly going to talk about the, the fun bits of, you know, let's just get some information about comparing greenhouse gas emissions from different food choices. So um, I, I probably, probably no prizes for guessing which causes the most greenhouse gas emissions out of um, steak um, and, and beans. Um, I mean, I guess, how different are they? Um, it depends a bit on how you cook the beans. Um, so I've done a, an example here with an eight ounce steak and fries or chips. Um, in the UK um, compared to um, a jacket potato done in the microwave with, um, with beans uh, cooked at home. So if we do that, 
then is about a factor of 20 difference, so more than a factor of 20 difference uh, between the steak dinner and the beans dinner. So my main message here really is that, that because different foods contribute very different amounts of greenhouse gas emissions, then there's a lot of potential for reducing climate change from food by making different food choices. So how does that, how does that work out when we look at other choices? Um, so what if we compare spaghetti bolognese with beef, with spaghetti bolognese with chicken or spaghetti bolognese with lentils? So how different do you think these are gonna be? Um, and what are the biggest contributions when we get down to the details of a spaghetti bolognese with lentils, then what is gonna be the biggest contribution to the climate impact? So just showing the details here, um, so you can, unsurprisingly, I guess, uh, for people on this group, then the spaghetti bolognese with beef is, is causing the most emissions. Um, and we can actually reduce our climate impacts by a factor of three if we switch to chicken, or by another factor of two um, on top of that if we switch to lentils. Um, but if we look in detail at the, the spaghetti bolognese lentils, um, as, as many of you may already be, be eating that kind of thing, then um, you know, e even if we include the lent with the, the canning process of the steel from the can, I've got that on there. So lentil can, so that's the, the, the steel. Um, that's not a huge contribution. So whether you have lentils out of a tin or whether you cook it by hand, it's not a huge deal when you're adding up the other things, partly because the canning processing um, is included in this lentils part and this canned tomatoes part, so that adds up. Um, so there's, there's, you know, but really the main thing for me is, is once we're down at this level, um, you know, it's more about trying to spread the word, right? So you, a lot of people come up to me at say science fairs and say, how can I reduce my greenhouse gas emissions even more? I'm already doing this, this and this and this. And I'm thinking, okay, so you're already probably reduced your emissions by a factor of two, three, four, five compared to the average person. And so to reduce them even further is really hard. Um, and yeah, if, if, and if you did that, it would have less impact than getting someone else to just reduce their emissions by say 10%. So I'm sure I don't need to convince you to, to spread the word about, about this topic. Um, but the other thing I think is really important is to compare it with something. So here I've put a, um, a benchmark in here. So the average amount of greenhouse gas emissions per person per day at the moment globally on average is about 6,000 grams per person per day and so if we want to halve that by 2030 um, if we want to keep in line with other things uh, by 2030 then that would take us to this grey bar here which is 3,000 so if we go with the spaghetti bolognese lentils then we're, we're, we've only about a third of our daily budget used up on dinner so that's kind of not too bad we're kind of on track there Whereas if we had the spaghetti bolognese with the beef, then we'd already be using um, more than the global average daily emissions um, on the one meal uh, in that particular case. What about um, coffee and tea? Um, so people often get surprised by this because we hear about, a lot about food miles and, and, um, and in fact, that's not the only thing. Um, so if, how much do you think it causes, um, contributes to our daily food emissions if you compare coffee with milk and sugar uh, with a black tea or with a latte um, and so typically lattes are made um, with mostly with milk um, so in this case here you can see that there there is a you know there is a difference between the the coffee with with a tablespoon of milk and and, and, and some sugar with the, the the black black tea but it's not a massive difference because they're both quite small already whereas if we have 500 mils of milk in a large latte then we've already used more than a third of our daily budget if we're, if we're trying to halve the average global greenhouse gas emissions per person per day. Um, let's look at some other examples. So what if you have um, a jacket potato uh, with beans? Um, and so what about, how does it compare if we cook that jacket potato in the oven um, for one person, or if we cook it in the oven for two people, or if we microwave it? So, um, uh, let's have a look at that. So if we're having jacket potato with beans and cheese um, for one person, then um, putting the oven on for two hours uh, for one person um, with a global average energy mix in the, in, in the um, electricity supply. So it would be, be lower for a UK uh, electricity supply, but similar for gas, for example. 
then actually the oven use is bigger than all the other contributions uh, put together. Uh, whereas obviously if we're cooking for more people, then we can share that oven use out between two different people in this case. Or if we we're going to microwave it, then because basically we're using the appliance for less time, um, then we're, we're right down here at um, you know, significantly uh, below the um, global average, um, half global average. So we've, we've got 500 out of 3000 used up there with our, with our microwave potato or beans. Uh, whereas if we went for the oven, um, you know, with the cheese, with the cheese and butter as well, then we, we've again blown our daily budget there uh, from the one meal. Um, so that's some examples. Um, there's lots more examples like that um, that we could talk about. And this is just maybe some people are quite interested to see how where do we stand at the moment in the UK on average. So this is analysing data from um, a um, dietary uh, a dietary diary uh, survey that's done routinely in the UK and matching that to greenhouse gas emissions uh, data. And so what you can see here is that su surprising to a lot of people that food waste contributes about one kilo or a thousand uh, grams in these units here to our, our daily greenhouse gas emissions from food due to um, unused food rotting at landfill sites. Um, so this is, you know, on top of the, the, the wasted um, emissions from producing food that wasn't eaten. Because food rots into methane, if it's um, in a wet environment, um, then that is, and that's more powerful than carbon dioxide as a greenhouse gas, then that, that contributes to climate change. And then these other things here are showing for the, for the typical average amounts that are eaten of beef and lamb uh, per day in the UK, then that's the, the, the next biggest contributor. We eat a lot of bread, pasta and cereal. So although per, you know, per bread slice, it's not a big deal. Once we add up the amount that we actually eat, then it, it contributes a bit there. Milk and cream, cheese and butter, chicken and turkey. So this, this just gives you a sense of, of where we might want to start if, for the average person in the UK. Um, so we've really been trying to talk to lots of people about this topic um, to try and raise awareness among people about the academic so current scientific consensus. We're not trying to sort of really um, recommend to people what to do. We just want people to know more information because we usually find that people are just not aware of the relative sizes of these numbers. So we set up this project um, that Hannah mentioned earlier called Take a Bite Out of Climate Change. And so on this website, we're trying to put three resources that people can use. And so um, one example here is um, Climate Food Challenge. So if you want to have a go at that, you can type that into Google and um, or go to our website and get your friends to play that. And you have to rank the three different foods in order of how much greenhouse gas emissions you think each one's got. So here, someone's clicked on a potato already, and then they might click on the cheese and then the beef, and then they'll get a tick or a cross and some points. And, and then they get another one and then another one. And it, it, it's, it's quite addictive the way that, um, the, way that the, the, the game developer put this together. So um, be careful if you give it, give it a go. And we're currently working with other countries. So we're working for a, a version in Telugu in uh, the collaborators in India, for example. So that's one thing that you can we find useful at science fairs and things to get people to engage with the general topic in a way that's sort of accessible to kids, particularly with like some iPads that they like to play with. In the old days when we could talk to people in person, this is. Um, another thing that we um, produced are these flashcards. There's 70 odd flashcards um, like this. Um, Unfortunately, I can't show you them in person because we've just given away the last pack. Um, so, um, but you can download them for free on our website and you can print them yourself. We're hoping to do a Kickstarter um, to, to help distribute these to the people who keep asking us for them and also to give free packs to schools and that sort of thing. So you can see here, what, what we did here was um, putting the number in grams of carbon dioxide equivalent, um, which I'm guessing I don't need to explain to you guys, but yeah, just to get a sense of the sort of numbers that people normally use in the academic literature but also to convert that into the equivalent number of minutes driving a car because like my kids will will say are we nearly there yet you know how many minutes is it till we get there but they're not going to necessarily engage with a number like this so that's to show that if you have 100 grams of steak then that's uh, excuse me sorry my son's guitar lesson is starting now and i'm hoping that uh, someone else is sorting this out but <laughs> excuse the ringing there um, so if you have 100 grams of steak, um, then that 
causes an equivalent amount of climate change to about 30 minutes driving or 29 minutes driving a car obviously depends on how fast the car is going and that kind of thing um, and you can compare that to other things like the same amount of chicken there would be six minutes for example um, and so uh, actually all the data for this is all linked to our website you can actually see all the original studies that that we got all the numbers from so that you can go back and read them if you want to do that and, and play with the numbers to your heart's content um, and uh, we also in June we um, we did some videos every day in June we put out um, a video every weekday um, to try to engage children um, at home potentially in this topic and so you can go and, and um, watch interviews with, with uh, Julian Harper too I'm sure you'll all be um, uh, will know well and uh, other people there other experts around the world and we put these worksheets together as well so that people can um, try out calculations so using those flashcards we got this um, challenge where people choose a different um, like between toast and bread or they choose between steak and cheese and beans and then the, the challenge is it walks you through like calculating the total uh, greenhouse gas emissions for those for those lunch options and you can see a small child here working out the greenhouse gas emissions of some uh, different choices there with the flashcards um, and all of this is referenced back to the literature in, in some of the um, stuff that's available there. So I'm going to stop uh, rambling on now um, so that I can listen to your questions. Um, I'm really excited about this Q&A format that's coming up. And if you want to get updates on any of that, those materials, then you can go to our website, um, take a bite out of climate change and sign up if you're interested. Thanks very much. Uh, I'll just let you bring your screen share off. Oh yes, yeah, so, uh, yeah. Um, great. Thank you so much for your um, talk, Sarah. I really enjoyed it. Um, there's been a lot of questions coming up in the chat, but I'll um, jump in with my question first, um, uh, which was that I noticed on the flashcards that you had water use as well as carbon emissions. Are there any foods which counterintuitively require huge amounts of water that we might not think of compared to? not being otherwise so bad or if you had to say which and another question kind of linked is if you had to say which is worse wasting right. a lot of water or wasting a lot of carbon yeah so i have to confess that um uh, yeah i haven't uh, so rosie green at, at um, london school of hygiene and tropical medicine led on the water use part so she's a bit better better place to talk about the very details of all those numbers um, but uh, yeah, I think it, it also the water use um, is a composite of the blue and green water for those of you who are experts on that nomenclature, which is the, the rainfall and the water that has to be put, it, put in um, through um, you know, irrigation. Uh, and so it will depend very much on the region and the, the water scarcity in that region. So one of the classic examples is growing potatoes in, um, in North Africa, uh, where often water is taken from underground aquifers and then applied um, to grow the potatoes. So that's something which wouldn't have a large greenhouse gas emissions. Um, but on the other hand, the water usage would be, would be a more dominant problem in that particular case. Um, uh, yeah, and I guess I didn't mention my sort of my, the bee in my bonnet right now, which is... Um, labeling so i mean that particular example is a really good example where you know for a given particular packet of potatoes you don't we don't know whether that water came from rainwater or irrigation um, and how that irrigation water was collected and so i'd really like to see labels on all food packets ideally well certainly with the greenhouse gas emissions um accredited mandatory across the uk and beyond um, for greenhouse gas emissions and ideally for other um, other impacts including water use biodiversity ideally um, but land use I think is a really important one um, and eutrophication is not 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 as hard to quantify as, as biodiversity um, and so I hope that by you know getting at least the greenhouse gas emissions on there then that would pave the way to get the other environmental uh, labels on there as well and we'd actually know the answer as a consumer because yeah it's a bit difficult 